Hello everyone. Um, welcome to today's episode. Um, and today I'm joined with Joe, and we're going to be speaking about autism. Um, yeah, and how Joe is involved with it. Um, how uh, yeah, basically the life of autism, really, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> uh, but Joe, if you don't mind, just doing a little introduction of yourself. Hi, I'm Joe. So I have two children. I have three children. Two children have autism. Um, both my boys um, ironically have autism and I used to work here with centre children I still kind of do a little bit but in a different capacity now and um, I think a huge part of my day is kind of different advocacy routes um, I was just explaining to Mason just kind of before we hit record I've got my finger in a lot of different pies so which I'm sure will um, kind of come up through this yeah. this chat but yeah i'm so excited to be here and chat yeah. with you yeah we 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 talked for a little while before about um or like hospital and um yeah. how, 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 how that impacts a lot, a lot of people with autism that they don't really to say if you have someone else in autism uh like um a like um, something completely different and yeah that you're there for that reason but they don't t take into account that you you have autism um yeah. which it, which is a shame um because not many people i don't know not, i don't know many people in hospitals do know that their patients have autism as well they probably do but don't really talk about it i think you're right and as, as we kind of said earlier i think there's a lot of doctors that haven't been as exposed I suppose I think autism even though it's been around for as long as time has been you know you don't all of a sudden just it's not a generational thing you know it, it is what it is but I think there's a lot more exposure to it now it's more oh I don't know what the word is I'm trying to think it's more talked about you know, it's not as kind of, I think, in a really nasty way, um, people who used to have autism, it wasn't called autism, it was called, you know, a really horrible word. And you used to get locked away. And that was kind of their way of dealing with it. It was, you know, behind the curtain kind of thing. Yeah. And absolutely rightly so, that no longer is a thing. But I think that wasn't taught. It was never taught. Um and that is why now you are getting a lot of struggles when, you know, you go to hospital appointments and, and things like that. The kind of sometimes you'll see consultants and, and doctors and they just don't understand it. Yeah. And I think that's I love having medical students in my appointments. I don't know about you, but whenever they say, oh, do you mind if so and so sits in? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. I really like that because they're so ready to learn and they're so ready to, you know, where they're still learning things, actually, for, for them, they're going to recall those moments in training and hopefully be able to utilise that later on. And I think it's so, so important. So, and that's kind of what we were talking about with this time for autism in Brighton and Hope with these fourth year medical students is that they work with families with autism and children with autism. So they can be better. They can be better doctors. And there is that understanding. And it's all about building relationships and creating a positive experience. Nobody wants to leave an appointment thinking that was a waste of my time or I didn't feel understood. I didn't feel heard. And, you know, that can happen whether you're neurotypical or if you're you know if you're neurodivergent but I, I think it's such it's such a a different experience being walking into an appointment and just thinking you know what I don't think I got to say everything I wanted to say than going into an appointment and going actually you know what I don't feel like I was understood or heard as a person um they're completely two different experiences and as doctors and professionals in general and people in general, we need, you know, we need to be more, there's so much 
you know, this kind of woke culture of we need to move with the times and, you know, there's advocacy of so many different areas, but because neurodivergency is more complex, it's not just, you know, black and white open and close, because there are so many elements to it, it's almost like people are kind of, they want those blinders on because it's too much for them to get their heads around, which is ridiculous but that's the only kind of logic i can put to why people are that way yeah and it's I, not everyone thankfully but <laughs> <laughs> you know. i i i find because for an appointment or when i'm in the hospital i speak to the liaison nurse um yeah. and we sort out a room to end because i don't like you know, you know when you go to appointments in hospitals, everyone's in the room, and um, I, I don't like that. Um, yeah. Um, I don't like it because I'm in like compromised, but I still don't like it because my autism. I don't like close contact anyway. Um, yeah. So you you have to kind of book. You have to talk about. You got to talk when you know your appointment is. Um, you have to book it. You have to talk to them, and get a room. Um which can, can be hard work, especially if appointment is cancelled. <laughs> because you have to say to them, you have to say, it's, it's cancelled now. It's, 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 Redo it's it again. Yeah. Do it again, again now. But yeah, um, it is irritating um, when people don't understand um, at, at hospitals, because you have to, you find, you find your, you'll speak to the lady at the desk and then she'll she probably don't know what you're talking about, and then you have to explain it to her. Um, um, and then there's another person, and then another person, and then it just gets like well, you're repeating yourself all the time. It, it, yeah. I mean, we've so my youngest son he's scheduled for an operation, and we've had the liaison of um, nurses and, and the play therapy team, and kind of everyone call us to do, um pre-op assessments and, and what they can put in place to um, make sure that day runs as smoothly as possible like he'll be the first on the list to go down and you know things like that um, and he'll have a special bed waiting for him in case he needs a safety bed and you know we can go into the anaesthetist room but we'll also be waiting for when he wakes up in the recovery area because he'll you know he really that would be way too much for him but actually, one of the interesting things that she said to us was they might ring you and offer you a cancellation appointment. Whatever you do, don't take that cancellation appointment, because if you take that cancellation appointment, the chances are we won't have any of those things in place for that day because you're literally just being slotted in. So actually, you really need to wait until that. So fingers crossed, nothing gets cancelled because, like you said, otherwise you've got to go through that whole process again. And I think there is that people don't really think about that when it comes to appointments. It's like actually, it's not just a case of oh I'll nip there and nip back. It's a big process. It's a huge process um, because it has to be right. It has to be right. Yeah, you have to. Um, like we said before, you have to book your whole day around it. So if you're working, um, like that, you have to go. You have to book that time of work, and they yeah. don't think about that. Like, uh, like we said, like it's normally about five minutes, maybe ten, <laughs> but um, it's not long. It's not a long time you're in there for, um, unless, unless I don't know, maybe something's gone wrong with what yeah. whatever you're taking. Um, but it's normally five minutes, and like they're, 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 sometimes it's more than an hour we're waiting, maybe two or three hours. I think that's about the longest I've waited, about two or three hours. Um, yeah, that's and wild. and it's crazy. And then we get in there, um, well, apologize, I say, sorry, oh, sorry, I'm running late. Um, and like. Being autistic. It's kind of just expected that yeah. you would just say, oh, okay, and be fine with it, but actually. Yeah. Like, if that was school or something, yeah. you lay at school, you'd be, be in trouble. You'd be in trouble. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. 
so do you ever get to a point where you kind of think that's too long I have to cut it because I know with my son's appointments if I know there's going to be a really long wait or we've been waiting there for a certain amount of time and you know he has a threshold of what he can handle and if it gets past that it's just you're no good to anybody nothing's going to happen so at that point I I kind of have to assess it and go say to the receptionist look I'm really sorry we're going to have to rearrange this because you know I understand that things happen and appointments carry over emergencies happen especially in hospitals but his threshold has been met and that's it we can't continue with this today we're going to have to rearrange do you ever get to a point where you're kind of like my threshold is met or will you just literally wait it out for that sake of kind of almost people pleasing I suppose if if like in the past I've waited so long and they've ended up yeah. cancelling it like or like or, or something but when I've been there and I, the, the, there hasn't been a time where I would just leave but I've come to that near about that kind of point yeah. where I'd be like I'm going now but the thing is if I go I'm going to have to do wait all these hours again another time yes um yeah. and I think I, yeah. I, don't, I don't want to do that again but, uh, um and it'll probably be like a few months later. Um, I'm just like, oh, yeah. I can't wait to disappoint at least because it's only like once a year that I have these kind of yeah. certain appointments. Um, yeah. And I think, <laughs> like, I think maybe that's why certain people don't understand things because you have these appointments once a year. They don't, they know you a little bit, but but maybe over the last years so you've seen this person maybe four, five, six times. And yeah. It's not a lot. It's, it's 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 not a lot to really know that person. And I think they've got this whole thing, don't they? I don't know about you, but I think I probably have one consultant out of about six that actually retains the the information about you from before. They never seem to want to read your chart before they get in that appointment. It's always on you to kind of go over everything again and again and again. I'm sitting there thinking, just read the chart. It's in front of you. You know, we've waited all this time. You could have taken an extra five minutes to read the chart. And this appointment will probably be a lot smoother. But I think that's probably a pet peeve of mine. One of the biggest, you know, I know in emergency situations, you don't have the luxury of being able to, you know, read the charts prior to that. But I think in scheduled appointments, it's so, so important, especially when you have, you know, neurodiversity that they are reading those files and they are getting to the crux of that information because it doesn't just help them it helps you Mm. and it just makes for a better experience all around and I I it does I must admit that is one thing I kind of no matter how busy you are I think if you're making people wait anyway take that extra bit of time so you know to provide that positive experience and actually I think sometimes I sit in front of doctors and uh, having me go over you know what's what's kind of been going on again and stuff and I think Hmm. do you actually know anything It, it makes me kind of concerned for what you want to do going forward because I think well I've sat in front of you how many times now and why are we going over the same things you know it's um it's it's like you're just going in the same day, isn't it? All the time. Which it can be really annoying. Like what you were saying earlier, that it's like kind of that inception where you wake up on the same day and repeat and repeat and repeat. Mm. It is that it's exactly like that. Yeah. Um and those kind of things, like films or stuff like that, it just makes me dizzy. <laughs> I <laughs> um like a couple of years ago, there was, I don't know, two episode that did that. And I just get dizzy. I get bored. I get bored like that. And other people be like, I yeah. love it. I love it. I love things like that. But for me, it's just round and circle. Like there's no storyline to it, really. So whoever writes those kind of things, it must be yeah. so easy for them because you're just. Yeah, it's lazy writing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Just you go know what? That... Yeah, that's exactly what my eldest is like. See, I don't like watching those things because I feel like I circle the plug hole and I go down that rabbit hole of, oh, what's this and this? Like, I can't think too much about infinity and things like that because 
it makes me spiral. Whereas my eldest son, he's just like, yeah, I'm bored. <laughs> it's, it's not interesting to me. It's lazy writing. This is, you know, but he's, he's really impressed. He's really into coding. And there's a game called Geometry Dash. And you kind of get to make your own levels. And he's got really, really into that. And um, it's so funny because he's, he, he does, he sees some game developers. He's like, they're boring. They do the same things over and over and over. There's no creativity. And um, it's like, look. And he shows me, he was showing me literally yesterday his progress from where he started to where he's at now and he's like do you see this do you see this i did this and it was wrong and now i do this and it's you know actually i really love that because i love to be able to see his thought process and his growth um it's it yeah i always find it so interesting the the way every person kind of has their own thoughts and their own you know the, the way they perceive life yeah to find if you're interested in something you'll know a lot about it and you want to know more about it um yeah. and like certain things can be like that like games um you're really interested yeah. in a certain game and you you want to do it more and um know everything about it <laughs> yeah yeah he's quite, actually his, his anxiety feeds a lot of his um obsessive interests as well so he is really my eldest He's so smart, but he's also really, it's to his own detriment. So things like lightning storms, thunderstorms, natural disasters, he, they really give him so much anxiety. But because of that, he wants to know absolutely everything there is to know about them. I remember we were having, um, I think it was during COVID, there was a really, really bad storm. And he said, well, you know what, mum, the best place for us to be is in the middle of the field with nothing around us, with our hands over our head, crouched down, because that is the safest place to be. And I said, where did you, where did you learn that? And he said, well, I hate, I don't want to be in that situation. So I've learned everything there is to know about it so I can keep us safe. And, um, but you can feel the panic. And the anxiety when he's talking about it but actually that drives him to I mean I've always said that information is power so I kind of I really do get that but it is funny isn't it how you can be obsessed with something because you love it but then equally just as obsessed with something because it it creates fear in you yeah um and I've never experienced that like with anyone else like it is with my son. Um Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Because Yeah, I I, 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 I guess that what makes him who he is. It, it, yeah. Like like with fear and yeah. like thriving on that. But actually I think in a way that makes him feel safe even though he doesn't like the event itself he where he knows everything about it he knows he's kind of taught himself that actually if I learn about it I can make myself feel safe because I can learn what not to do or how to escape it and you know things like that so yeah I think there's that saying feel feel the fear and do it anyway and I think for him it's I'm definitely not going to go and do it, but I'm going to feel the fear and make sure I don't do it, make sure I know everything I can to not do it. Um, yeah, it's it's so interesting. I always kind of say he's, my eldest is kind of like, have you ever seen the Big Bang Theory? Yeah. I always say he's kind of like Sheldon Cooper, but he's very, very empathetic and he's also got a very sarcastic, dry sense of humour. But he's got that very rigid kind of thinking. Um, and it is very black and white for him. But then at the same time, every now and then, he'll just hit you with some sarcasm. And, but it's very well thought out. Um, yeah. Uh, and yeah, he's always been, you know, my... So his brother is, you know, there's a only a three-year age gap between them but 
kind of my middle child has brain damage so he's kind of a forever toddler he's forever kind of stuck at that one year kind of age yeah. um he's almost nine now um but my eldest has always been his biggest advocate and he's been his you know wanting to do things for him and you know been his driving force so he's got that empathy for everyone actually it was when he was diagnosed himself with autism and he said but mum I'm nothing like you know so my friend at school's got autism and I'm not I'm not like him at all and I and I thought no you're not wrong you're not wrong at all but and I kind of had to explain that actually you're nothing like your brother either but you still have the same diagnosis and actually again that was something that you thought well now I want to learn everything about autism because you know to me to him having autism was always associated with being severely disabled and so when he saw other people that had additional needs he would always disguise his own because he'd be like well I'm not at the level they're at so therefore I cannot have additional needs so we had to take a really long time to help him to recognize that just because your additional needs aren't the same as theirs it doesn't mean that they're not valid in their own right and it doesn't mean that actually they're any less than it they're just different like everybody you know Someone might like the colour blue, someone might like the colour red. You know, everyone has differences. They're still, you know, they're still, yeah. you know, individuals and people. And um, it took him a really long time to kind of get his head around that. And it wasn't a shame thing. It wasn't like, oh, no, I'm not, you know. It was just he was genuinely like, how? How could I be? Because he's only seen extreme, you know, extremes, but... I was trying to explain to him with his brother that he has, you know, brain damage and that's really, you know, that is his primary diagnosis. You know, he has brain damage and that he's kind of constantly on reroute. He's got brain damage all over his brain. So whenever he he's constantly trying to readapt to get to, you know, what he needs to be doing. You know, I said to I said to my old, I said, You don't have brain damage, so you're not constantly on reroute. Um I said, Oh, yeah, I didn't think about it that way. And I said, Well, no I said there's no right or wrong, is there? I think, you know how how are you meant to know? How are you, you know? Yeah, it's such a You can't see it. It's it's like autism. You can't see it, so it's it's going to be different, or it's going to be hard for to understand. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, his brother has a wheelchair, and he doesn't. So it's like, well, I can't be autistic because he has a wheelchair, and I don't. Like, yeah. that's not. Yeah. I think, which is understandable. Like when you are diagnosed, or you just find out a little bit more about it yourself, you you kind of think people with autism it's like that this this thing yeah, about it where you think people ha have autism if they can't communicate or they can't yeah. do anything for themselves or they can't speak um like, like we are now they just think that those type of those type of people are autistic and like they in a wheelchair um yeah stereotype yeah yeah but it, it's it's anyone people communicate people can't um like when i was diagnosed i was a bit like your son in a way where i'd be like how are they like me i'm i'm, <laughs> I've, I'm autistic i've got autistic and i'm I've got autism and they don't they're not like me they're really good at maths i'm not what's going on yeah yeah <laughs> um but it did take I me a little while cool. I think that's all people are ever exposed to. It's the extremes of one thing, isn't it? Or it's the, there, there are stereotypes. It's, oh, yeah, you must be really good at maths. You must be, you know, hyper intelligent. Um, or you must be the other extreme where you've got a learning disability and you're in a wheelchair and you can't, you know, fend for yourself. I think, were you diagnosed quite young 
or were you diagnosed later or not? I think my middle son, he was diagnosed very, very young, um, literally uh, just two. And then my eldest was diagnosed when he was about eight or nine. And actually, there was a huge difference in, you know, kind of, I think maybe the older you are because you're so used to your lifestyle and you being you and there's never been any question about it to all of a sudden have this label. It's it's kind of like, well, hang on a minute. What, where's this come from? <laughs> you know, and I think, you know, that was the same for my eldest. It was kind of like, well, where's this label all of a sudden come from? Um, you know, that's not what I've known. <laughs> what, why am I autistic now? Where did this come from? Yeah. It's quite crazy. I was, I was done as nine. I was. Yeah. 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 Um, I remember parts of it getting diagnosed, but I went to London, like Great Ormond Street. I think. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, and then I, I, I did go to. I obviously went to primary school, but then I, I went to a mainstream school after that, and then. They didn't understand me at all. Um, yeah. they, they were quite bad, really, for understanding autism and kids in general. Um, and then I did go to, like, uh, a, a SEND school Yeah. after that. I think that's the struggle we're having at the moment because... So we lived in a different area and my son went to the same primary school up until year five. And so he'd grown up with his kind of friendship group and they'd always everyone just takes you for you you know and you grow up so they're just like oh that's just how Max is oh that's just how Roy is that's just how you know whoever is the you know they are they're how they are and then I think when we moved areas to be closer to our family for more school and when he moved to a different school and they were just meeting him for the first time he got he he had a really hard time from then he's just started you know he's in year seven now and again it's such a almost like a baptism of fire because you haven't grown up around these people they are new people they don't know your quirks and you know the things that make you you and they just expect you to be a certain way like oh why don't you like Fortnite? he can't stand Fortnite. he can't uh, he just doesn't understand why people want to run around and kill each other. But all his friends want to play Fortnite. So yeah. it's kind of, it, he is struggling immensely with having that safety blanket of all the people who grew up around him and just accepted him for him, you know, because they grew up with him. So now all of a sudden meeting new people who don't know him and as horrible as it does sound, they don't accept, you know, his quirks and, and who he is. And it is, it's really horrible. And it's, I've seen him try to change and adapt to be more like them. And I, you know, that was really heartbreaking. Um, yeah. And I've kind of really honed it into him that don't worry what everyone else is doing. They're not you. They're, you know, when you come home, they're not, you know making your dinner they're not you know living your life they're not sleeping in your bed you have to do at the end of the day things that interest you and make you happy you know they're they're not living the life you live they've not got walk in your shoes so you wouldn't tell them to be a certain way don't let them tell you to be a certain way yeah but, i think i think when you're like when you're that age you Feel like you have to, I guess, copy people and try and fit in, um, and then, and then uh, for a certain time, you, you you feel like I don't have to do this, I don't have to do it to like impress your friends. You just want people yeah. there. You want to be your friends, and it's hard once you actually leave, once you leave your the school that you've known for a long time, where yeah. all your friends, and then you leave, and then I'm probably not with them anymore. Uh, yeah. or, or see them, right? You're fine. A lot of people at school you, you only probably talk to maybe one or two at least M maybe not even that yeah. um and then it gets harder it, get, it gets hard because you'll be it, it's more i guess they try and make you more to do things on your own um after yeah. you left primary school um and then 
I don't think they they do that right um, with people who are got uh, got needs they need help with. Yeah. Um, yeah. They just they're like the teachers will be like treat them all as one rather yeah. than one on one. Yeah, because he's so my eldest is book smart, so he doesn't have any kind of learning difficulties in in that aspect. Whereas my other son, he's in a sense before he's got severe learning disabilities. But what he, so he can do, you know, maths, English, I think he's doing Spanish at the moment. So, you know, he, that kind of stuff he does. But actually, it's the more abstract language of, you know, when there's more things to interpret, that's what he struggles with. And daily living tasks is what he struggles with. You know, he's only just learnt to do his laces. Um, he really struggles with because he's got a coordination disorder as well. Um, they do food tech and he can't he can't cut things and he doesn't have that dexterity. And actually they're things that he teach go, You're eleven years old, you're nearly twelve, how are you how can you not do that? And it's so dismissive and it's so rude. It's like how can you, you know, you're in top set, but yet you can't do this. And, it's, mm. and I think he struggles there because in a sense school, he says, well, I don't belong there. I feel out of place. I, I know I can learn those lessons. I can learn what they're telling me on mm. paper. But I know I can't, you know, do my buttons up. And, you know, I, I find crowds very difficult. And when... My teacher is saying, "Oh, don't you know this? I I don't know what they mean. I'm because they're being sarcastic. They're not using language that I can understand. I understand the lesson, but I don't understand how they're teaching it. Um, mm. and almost I feel he has it worse in that aspect because it he does feel like where do I fit? I don't fit in mainstream. I don't fit in send. Where can I go?" that's going to, you know, nurture me and understand me and I'm going to actually be able to grow. And that is an ongoing battle with his, you know, his school at the moment. They actually have a centre, so like kind of like an autism unit, I guess. Um, autism hub. Yeah. Um, but it's very much you're either in mainstream or you're in the hub. Even though they can integrate, there's not... It does. It feels very much us versus them, and I hate that. I hate that for him because I I get that he needs that additional time and the additional space, but for him, he just wants to fit in. He just wants to go with everyone else. Um, I, I wish I had a magic wand and I could make everything great for everyone um yeah and as a parent trying to um watch your child go through that is really really difficult and I think that's quite I we met on the other podcast didn't we and um mm. I really like having speaking to adults with autism and neurodivergency because for me it's an insight into my future and I can almost get tips and tricks off you guys of how I can make my children's life better for them because there's no book, there's nothing that, you know, and like I said, you're never going to get it right, but I think it's so important to just always be open and wanting to be open and wanting to learn, wanting to nurture what's right for them, but also, you know, set them up on a realistic path as well. I want to be able to do that. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, with, with, with food tech, you can't believe at that age people would expect people to do that. Um, yeah. Um, I always didn't like it because MDA staff, especially, would just stand there expecting you to put the oven on, expecting you to cut this up a certain way yeah. without it, without actually teaching you. Uh, well, well, no, they, that's exactly they, what he said. Yeah, and they would expect you to do that. Um, and. This was at a mainstream school, though, um, for me. Yeah. Um, but they would. I, I would, I would, I would enjoy the food once I ate it and everything. But it was just making it. And once I actually cut myself and I bled, 
yeah. um, or I, I bet myself. That's when they actually, they come in and it's almost like um, they're different if, if things happen after they've done them. But yeah, that's, it's crazy with the food the tech. Is they, they, um, for some reason, they just say, this is the recipe, follow the recipe. And I don't know if it's just your teacher being lazy or this is the standard, but they don't check his food after to make sure it's cooked. And I remember they made the heaters, and he loves the heaters. So he came home, and he was really excited to eat them. And he cut into it, and the chicken was raw, absolutely raw. And he was so disappointed because from the outside, it looked cooked, it looked great. But as soon as you cut into it, it was, you know, it was raw. And um, I said, well, did your teacher check it? And he said, well, you just no. He said it was fine. And, you know, um, and actually, I think that was a big realisation for him that he, he wasn't getting that pure support that he should have got, you know. I said, did you have help cutting it? Did you? And he said, well, there's another boy in my class with autism. And he's got a one-to-one -one for that lesson. Now, he should have a one-to-one. -one but he doesn't. And he said, oh, so I I was working with him, but she just helps us cut it up and then we cook it. Um, and maybe the teacher thinks because we have her, he doesn't need to check ours. So yeah. we're just left what it is. And I just think that's such a cop-out, you know, for that to happen to any child, but especially a child who's really dedicated that time to really make sure that they are working so hard to get that right. Um, it's, a, it's a shame. And he, he actually has quite similar problems in art. So even though he's really creative in storytelling, he likes to kind of make um, storylines and actually illustration and stuff like that is not for him he's really he's not good at writing or art it's not it's never been his thing and he's so come to accept that he's like I'm not good at it I'm never going to be good at it I don't care I don't need to be an artist that's not what my you know my purpose is but we got um like at the end of January we got kind of a expectations of where your child is you know in the in the like what level they're at um and they said oh he's really you know he's failing art and I I kind of thought do you know him have you met him because you know you'd know why and actually I said to them well if you gave him a computer project to do if you allowed him to make that with you know, I can't remember what it is these days, Photoshop or, you know, to create kind of a digital poster, you'd have something completely different. Um, so now they allow him to create when they're saying, oh, you know, do this portrait or whatever. Now they kind of allow him to do a digital version of it. And just that one tiny tweak has made him go from, you know, failing to, being found where it should be yeah. and it is it, it's crazy that as you would think as a teacher you know maybe for the length of the time and the amount of different children that they get walking through their doors they'd be able to think of things like that but um you always kind of have to come in as yeah i mean whenever i walk into this school there's always the, the heads go down and the kind of you know attitude comes out and I think I shouldn't have to be this much of an advocate for my child I mean I'm going to be regardless but it shouldn't take me coming in here having to be the big bad balls as such because you're not adapting and you're not doing your job you're just seeing everybody as this uniform you know you should be in this box if you don't fit that box you know, it shouldn't be that you can only access education if you're um, fit into that mainstream mould. Yeah. Uh, you know. Yeah. 
I agree. Like, I find, I mean, some schools will be, every school is different, of course. Um, but, Yeah. but I think some schools may have changed this. But when I when I was at school, I was one of the people that maybe needed a bit more support. So what what they would do, they would put us in this little group in the corner, um, of the room, and when well, not in the corner, just on the table, um, but four of us. And then one day, uh, one helper, and I find now looking back, that was terrible, a terrible way to do it because you're just kind of singling us out like we're the Yes. dumb kids, and then everyone else is not. Um, and I don't know, Yes. I don't know if you feel the same way uh, if a child has a one to one. To say they have that one to one in the lesson, they feel Yeah. maybe the child would feel that, um, They can't ask their MDA staff for help because they're helping that child Yeah. over there, even though they probably need the help. Uh, not that Yeah. they don't, but the thing is that that MDA staff is not going to help another person because they're more Yeah. concentrated on that person that they've been told to help. Yeah. It's a very, very flawed system. And it's something that is is permanently going to need tweaking. It's, it's never going to be right. You can't please everybody. But that's not to say that changes can't be made. And I think, you know, you're right. So when I was initially teaching, it was that same premise of you would have a group of learners that needed additional help. And you would either take them to a different table or you take them outside and you'd segregate them from everyone else so they could have differentiated learning when actually the way that I was differentiating, you know, changing their learning, adapting towards them applies to everybody still. It still applies to everybody. It's just instead of saying, you know, A plus B equals, you know, C, I'm getting... You know, I'm using visuals in front of you to show you and to model that to you. Or we're giving you a different method. It doesn't mean that method's wrong. You're still getting the same answer. You're just able to break it down in a different way. And that that can count across the board. That That can be learning across the board. And actually... I had many children that were classed as, you know, able learners and they would kind of come over to me and they'd, or they'd hover over while I was teaching them. You could see them kind of going, oh, that makes more sense. You know, I understand that better than, you know, what's kind of being told to me across the board. Um, and I do think, especially in primary, you know, where you're not in sets yet, you know, you're not kind of, broken up into different abilities as such why why can't we you know tailor our learning to be more inclusive there's absolutely no reason for it not to be more inclusive um and i think unfortunately unless there is key things changed within how you're taught so when you go to university and you know you're taught how to teach unless there are fundamental changes within that there's little chance for future teachers because when you then go on a work experience you're usually put with a matron of you know one of them the matriarchs of learning you know oh, they've been here 50 plus years what they know isn't worth knowing but actually you know i i'd rather be with someone much newer in their career I suppose because they're more adaptive they're more open they're more ready to switch their learning and I think if that's one thing I really love about my um other sons he's in a SEN school and instead of being kind of focused on one particular way of learning they have what they call learning hubs So they've got um, exploration level, in investigation level and engineer level. Um, and it's so you've got kind of your explorers that are just at the beginning of their kind of learning journey. It's more of holistic, sensory, you know, getting you ready to learn. And then when you're kind of at that investigator stage, you've got kind of those basics of the principles of learning down. 
but you're really kind of getting into it. And then your engineer level is kind of like, I've mastered those two and I'm really fine tuning those skills now, but it's not um, done on age. So it's not like your year one, your year two, your year three, you have to go up. Um, so my son, he should technically be year three, but he's still in what would be classed as a reception class. Um, and it's not done on, you know, year groups, it's done on ability. And actually, he has come on so much because he's in the right place and yeah. the right level for him. And that just, I really do think that that needs to be more across the board. And it is more than possible, in my opinion, um, for that to be in mainstream schools and for it to be more inclusive in, you know, the way that people learn. And then maybe when you get to high school, there wouldn't be as much. I mean, there's always going to be people who are mean, but there wouldn't be as much um, spotlight on being different or, you know, having to be a certain way. I don't think they, I agree. I, I, I don't think they prepare you enough for yeah. like high school in, yeah. in primary school it's, it's almost like right it's nice and easy in primary school you're in these you're in these small classrooms which is lovely um the classrooms but um but with getting it's totally different say you go straight to mainstream um send might be a bit smaller but it's still different to primary like it's yeah it's still it's still going to be different um but yeah they don't other than maybe your induction they, they don't really do much they're like um see you later yeah get on with it yeah, yeah. It, that's the culture isn't it it's kind of like get on with it yeah um but yes yeah, it is crazy hopefully all these things do change um yeah but, uh, hopefully yeah I think there's more, um, there's the send reform group, which are really, you know, pushing for change. There is a lot of um, parents now pushing for those changes and, 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 you know, pushing for things to happen. I've met so many people who have said that, you know, if you think it's hard getting support for your child when, you know, growing up you wait until you get into adult social care that is a you know it's kind of like you hit 18 and it's like bye see ya fend for yourself it's, you know go be someone else's problem and I just think yeah, I'm um I think it's yeah it's as a parent I worry about my children getting older because I worry that outside of the home because what I, I can control you know the support they get inside of the home but outside of the home I worry about the support they would they would get you know like in work and society you know yeah. there needs to be change you know just as much as we don't have black and white tvs anymore you know we're a completely different culture of people than we were in the 1950s and I think the government especially don't really want to move with those times there seems to be still a very archaic institutionalized version of what you know society should look like and um, we're just not there we're you know we're so far beyond that now there's lots they just don't want to do. There's lots of, especially during COVID, so much confusion, so much confusion with, with what you have to do. Um, but I think we want change. Well, I mean, for people now in 2024, it's not a nice world um, at the moment. Um, I suppose uh, it, it's not nice. So it is going to be harder. It's gonna be it's gonna be harder than like twenty years ago, in schools and, and work. It's it's hard. Yeah. Very hard. Um, yeah. 
But uh, Joe, before we finish, is there like yeah. I don't know any advice maybe you have, maybe for other like maybe parents um who have autistic children or anything? I think the only thing I've always said is you can't be a big enough advocate for your you know your whoever you have whether that be a child whether that be a partner a friend you know you need to champion that person and if there's if there's a way you would want to be treated you need to make sure that they're treated that same way there there shouldn't be this difference there shouldn't be levels and I think as a parent especially like I said I you know there are some many a places that I walk into and people put their head down and think oh my god not them again and it's just because all you're doing is advocating your all you want is the same respect and the same attention paid to you know the person you're advocating for as you would anyone else and it's so important to not get beaten beaten down by that and you know it's okay not to accept the word no it's okay to you know say I'm not that's not that wouldn't be okay to you why should it be okay to them um without being branded difficult it's so easy to be labeled difficult and um actually wear that as a bit of a badge of honor now if uh, it's a good day if someone's deemed me difficult that day because it means that I'm advocating well enough for you know my children and you know the community um if you're not happy about something speak up about it and if something makes you incredibly comfortable uncomfortable you have every right just as much as anybody else to feel comfortable and to you know live your life yeah. Um, don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Yeah, I agree. I think like it's also important to speak out if things are going wrong. If there's, it's hard at school because maybe you don't get on with everyone, like old teachers. Yeah. So maybe try and find if there is a one teacher that you do get on with, speak yeah. to them. There might not be. If not, just wait till you get home. But yeah. it's good. It's 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 a bonus if 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 there's a teacher that you trust at school yeah. that you can go yeah. to um yeah and it's probably not gonna be every teacher because teachers do blab sometimes um in the staff room <laughs> yeah. um but it's always important if things don't, don't hold it in if, if things are going wrong or yeah. you're having a bad day speak to someone it might be a friend or just someone um someone you feel trusted with yeah yeah because it, it it makes you feel worse you you feel like your day's gonna go even worse if you're just holding it in all day just get it off your chest and hopefully yeah. it's all right absolutely yeah well thank you joe for uh coming on the podcast today thanks for having me yeah it was it, it was great fun um um talking about I don't know, hospitals autism um yeah not an awful lot is talked about hospitals so it's um no. it's, it's good we talk about that um i don't think we intended to talk about that did we today <laughs> um no. so it's, it's really nice seeing your perspective on it though because there is there is so much you know as you know when you have neurodivergency quite often you do have medical associations whether that be directly linked or indirectly linked you know and actually there is big changes that need to be made within the medical system and seeing your perspective as an adult struggling at those appointments and you know having those difficulties in those appointments actually just makes me feel more passionate about being you know when you know advocating for my child because they're I know they're feeling exactly the same way and they can't tell me you know they they don't feel comfortable saying that so yeah. hearing you kind of talk about it actually you know it it just it does make me feel like okay you know i am doing the right thing <laughs> yeah. i'm not just being overbearing no. <laughs> yeah. it's, it still happens and it's hard when you get any adult ward because it is different to when you was in like children ward um and like yeah it's it's hard but as you speak about these things 
um, with yeah. correct people, hopefully changes can be made. Absolutely. Fingers crossed. Um, but thanks, Joe. Um, Thank you. On again. Um, and to anyone listening uh, or watching today, we hope you enjoy it as well. Um, and we'll see you in in the next episode. But uh, hope you have a nice rest of your day, Joe. And thanks again. You too. Yeah. Bye.